Uh, a lot of news again uh, from uh, from the Middle East, uh, from uh, Israel's continued war. Uh, we, uh, <coughs> we we talked about yesterday about the assassination uh, of uh, the Hezbollah military leader uh, 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 Faoud Shukr Shukr, um, who uh, supposedly is the number two and number three in Hezbollah, so a very senior leader, the most senior leader of Hezbollah that Israel has targeted. Um, and for many hours, there was no confirmation of his death from the uh, Hezbollah side, from the Lebanese side. But about a half an hour ago, an hour ago, uh, they finally confirmed. I think what they did was they, they, they finally found his body in the, in the uh, rubble uh, and, uh, and announced uh, that he had, uh, he had died. So uh, that was the first, and we, we talked about that yesterday. Uh, and, um, uh, and, and that was uh, in, in Beirut. It was uh, an apartment building in Beirut. And, uh, you know, one of, the, one of the political implications of that is, I mean, Israel was asked directly by the Biden administration, by uh, Europeans, nothing in Beirut. You, you know, you can go to war with Hezbollah, don't attack Beirut, leave, it, leave Beirut alone. Well, the Israelis didn't listen. Uh, that is, that is the uh, main lesson of that. And then, of course, this morning we woke up to the news that uh, the uh, the political uh, leader of Hamas, Ismail Hanea uh, Hania, uh, was uh, killed, assassinated uh, overnight in his. You know, uh, apartment at a complex inside, on the northern side of, uh, but inside Tehran. Um, and that he and his bodyguard were the only ones who were killed. Um, and and this, this assassination uh, has stirred things up quite a bit. I mean, this is the number one leader of the political wing of, uh, of Hamas. Of course, Israel... Israel committed to assassinating everybody involved in October 7th, both on the political side and the military side. This is them fulfilling part of this promise. Uh, regularly, um, uh, Ismail is in Qatar. Uh, Israel probably decided not to uh, attack, as, as obviously decided not to uh, do anything in Qatar. Qatar is a, quote, and I say, quote, ally of the United States, uh, and as a consequence, I think that it's off limits. Uh, Hania was uh, in Iran uh, yesterday for the celebration of the uh, the new president, uh, the inauguration of the new president of Iran, the so-called pretend moderate, uh, who who was sworn in, I guess, yesterday, and he was there for the ceremony, as were many, many uh, leaders of terrorist organizations from around the Middle East. Uh, the Houthis were there. The Islamic Jihad was there. The Hezbollah was there. Anyway, he was representing Hamas at this event. Uh, I, I mean, I think Israel would have done better to strike the event. They could have taken out the supreme leader, the president, uh, and the leaders of most of the terrorist organizations in the Middle East. But anyway... That, I guess, is diplomatically not, not right. Uh, anyway, they waited until he went back to his room, uh, and uh, they literally threaded a missile. I mean, this is, this is amazing, and, and I want you to, to, to contemplate this for a minute. Um, this is, this is, they threaded a missile basically into the window of his apartment. The rest of the building was not damaged. I don't think it was a very big bomb. It was enough to kill him. But they threaded it. They knew exactly where he was sleeping. They knew exactly how to thread it. Now, we're talking about uh, the capital city of Iran. We're talking about a, um, a city that is 1,000 miles, about 1,600 kilometers, 1,000 miles from Tel Aviv. Uh, nobody saw it coming. Iranian air defense systems did not even see it coming. They had no clue what hit them. So Israel has done here a number of things, I think. One, it has killed somebody they swore to kill. It has killed somebody 
clearly, unequivocally, of those responsible for the October 7th massacre. Uh, it, remember, he, he, he was seen on video watching the October 7th, like on, on TV as these videos were being uploaded by the Hamas, uh, smiling, laughing, celebrating, and then going down on his knees and praying to Allah. Uh, everybody in that room with him should have has got, I think, a death sentence now, or should have a death sentence now. Anyway, uh, uh, so they've killed the number one political leader of Hamas, and and that is that is a huge statement. We'll, we'll talk more about that in a minute, maybe. But then the other thing they've done is they have shown that they have the capability. Israel has shown that they have the capability to basically take out anyone and probably anything, any Iran that they want without detection. I mean, my assumption here is uh, that this was an air launch, this was an airplane launch missile, that the airplane basically flew over Jordan and into Iraq uh, at very low altitude, uh, positioned itself uh, in Iraq, and, uh, you know, fired the missile uh, from there, uh, from a plane, uh, a smart missile, a missile that was guided to the building through the window into the bedroom of the guy they were supposed to kill. And, uh, you know, this could have been the Iranian supreme leader, could have been the new Iranian president. It could have been that helicopter that went out. No, I, I don't think Israel did that, but it could have been, right? Um, it, it could be the nuclear facilities. It could be drone factories. It could be any target in Iran. Israel has the capacity, if it wants, to take out. And, and, and that, is, that is huge. That is huge as a, you know, as... Let the bad guys know. I mean, I wish Israel just had a list publicly and they would cross people off periodically and just everybody would know who's on the list. That would put the fear of Allah into all of them. And that's what they need. See, Islamism will only go away. Islamism will only go away when they start fearing the West, Israel being a representative of the West, more than they fear Allah. And, and that's... What needs to happen? It, it, these leaders need to be taken out one at a time, um, and, and there should be no safe haven. But So here Israel has, in a sense, shown its military capabilities. I mean, if I were the president of Turkey, I would be paying attention to this. Are you really going to send troops into Lebanon to uh, fight with Hezbollah when Israel has the capability to thread a bomb into your bedroom? Now, I don't think Israel would ever do that. Remember, Turkey is a NATO country. But, you know, you got you to gotta, you gotta make them think twice, right? So this is what deterrence means. Deterrence means that you have the capacity and the willingness to take anybody out anywhere. And this is in Tehran, the capital of Iran. I mean, the mighty Iran. Uh, brilliant move. I wish they'd done this earlier. I wish they did this more often. I wish they targeted more. Uh, I, I, I wish they would take out the supreme leader uh, and, uh, and 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 uh, and maybe the head of the uh, um, Islamic Republican Guard. But okay, you know, I, I'm not going to get my wishes. Generally, I know that to be true. So I'll, I'll take I'll take this and and yesterday's uh, killing. Of, uh, of the Hezbollah chief as steps in the right direction. But let me just say this then. <laughs> I think that's great. But let's be clear about something. This is not, cannot replace victory on the ground. That is, killing leaders does not win wars, particularly not in the Middle East. Killing leaders does not bring you victory. If that had been the case, Israel would have beaten Hamas many, 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 many years ago. Indeed, 
the founder of Hamas, Chef, uh, Sheikh Yassin, Sheikh Yassin, was assassinated by Israel a long time ago. Didn't stop Hamas from growing. Uh, uh, Israel has killed repeatedly military leaders, military leadership within Hamas or the Palestinian uh, movement, and new leaders come about. What has to be destroyed is the will to fight. What has to be destroyed is the motivation. What has to be destroyed is the idea, the idea that they can ever win. They have, the will has to be crushed, annihilated. And, you know, killing their leadership is good. I am not against it. It's one piece of the puzzle. But it does not and can never replace actual on-the-ground victory, destruction of infrastructure, destruction of troops, and a breaking of the spirit and the will of the people. This is not a war with Hamas. I've said this before. This is a war with Palestinians, with Gazans in this case. And their will must be broken. They must learn to hate Hamas. They must learn to hate the idea of destroying Israel because the, the idea of destroying Israel will bring about their own destruction. So they must, Israel must continue. It must continue in Gaza. It must continue military operations. It must continue, you know, killing as many of the armed and, and operational functions of Hamas within the Gaza Strip as they can. As much as they can. And it is the only way that they can win. Now, there is an excellent editorial today, and, and God, I mean, I'll talk about the Wall Street Journal in a minute, but this is in the Wall Street Journal. It's an editorial page, so the editorial page is pretty good, but the rest of the the rest of it, I'll, I'll read you some headlines from the Wall Street Journal today. Um, by Daniel Pipes, who, who uh, you know, I did a lot of events with after 9-11 and came to uh, respect him quite a bit, and I thought he was quite good. Uh, and um, Daniel Pipes writes today in, uh, in the Wall Street Journal something I agree with him completely. He says, uh, the problem with Netanyahu is that he speaks about complete victory, total victory, clear victory, absolute victory, decisive victory, and full victory. And he even wore a total victory baseball cap. But that's all talking. And the fact is that since October 7th, Netanyahu has engaged in, uh, you know, what he always engages in. On the one side of his mouth, he talks about total victory. On the other side of his mouth, he's negotiating with terrorists. And he has not committed to one or the other. He has not done either one of them particularly well. And uh, Pipes hopes in this editorial, and I join him in hoping that the killing uh, in Tehran last night is basically an indication that Netanyahu has chosen victory over negotiation. Victory is the only path to free the hostages. Victory is the only path to make sure there are no future hostages. Victory is the only path to hold back Israel's enemies all over the Middle East. It, it, victory is the only path ultimately for peace with Israel's neighbors, including victory is the only path to peace with the Palestinians. The only solution for the Israeli-Palestinian conflict is Israeli, unequivocal, thorough, unmistakable victory and Palestinian defeat, an acceptance of that defeat, an acceptance they must change their ways. Now, uh, hopefully with this killing, that is the path Israel takes. Um, 
it, you know, uh, uh, Hania was, the guy who was killed yesterday, the Hamas terrorist who was killed yesterday, was basically the lead negotiator of uh, the deal that is being negotiated right now as we speak. Still negotiations, I guess, are going on. Or maybe they're suspended now that he was killed. Uh, but he was the lead negotiator. Maybe that kills the negotiation. Maybe now Israel can get on with the business of winning this and getting it over with and getting those hostages home, not through capitulation, but through victory. Now, Hania uh, has a long history, of course, with Hamas. He was there as a young man with, uh, uh, with the founders of Hamas, the founding of Hamas. He has been involved in uh, Hamas terrorist activities for, uh, you know, since the uh, late 1980s. He actually had, was in jail in Israel for a few years. Uh, Hanaya is a terrorist. He is, uh, you know, the, the, the mastermind of presenting Hamas as a political entity while letting its military wing commit terrorist activity after terrorist activity. He was actually the Palestinian prime minister when Hamas won the elections in uh, 2005 for a short period of time before the Palestinian president fired him, which led to a civil war within the Palestinians, leading to the Hamas killing uh, and, and, uh, and uh, uh, throwing out uh, the Palestinian Authority from the Gaza Strip and taking complete control. That was him. Again, he has stood side by side with the military wing of Hamas in all their terrorist activity. This is a monster, one less monster in the world. I'll give that a thumbs up. But this is how the Wall Street Journal has a headline, right? Killing of Israel's foes puts Middle East on brink of wider war. Really? Or is the fact that Hamas killed 1,200 Israelis, butchered them, slaughtered them, raped them, tortured them on October 7th, what is putting us on the brink of a white war? Or maybe, maybe, just maybe, I don't know. Maybe the fact that Hezbollah has been launching missiles into, the, into Israel since October 7th, killing Israelis, and then recently killed 12 children, maybe, just maybe, that is what is putting Middle East on the brink of a wider war. No, it cannot be. It cannot ever be that the terrorists are at fault. It cannot ever be that the Islamists are at fault. It cannot ever be that the, that the, that the Arabs are at fault. No, it's never them. They are, I don't know, kind of innocent. Certainly, if you believe in intersectionality, that's a must. The fault has to be with Israel. The fault has to be with the Jews. The fault has to be with Israel killing its foes. As if the killing of foes is out of context, came out of nowhere. And yeah, thank goodness, not God, but goodness or whatever. Thank, uh, thank freedom, thank civilization, that Israel is capable of killing more of its enemy than the enemy is capable of killing Israelis. Thank freedom, thank technology, thank liberty, thank freedom, thank civilization, that that is true. But you don't do tit for tat. Oh, you kill one, I kill one. You'd kill two, 1,200, I'll kill 1,200. No. When somebody initiates force against you, you destroy them. There is no compromise. There's nothing short of victory that is acceptable. There is nothing short of the complete bringing to their knees of the opposition. So killing of Israeli foes put Middle East on brink of wider war is disgusting and despicable. It is the killing of Israelis. It is the unwillingness of Palestinians to, to, to live peacefully with Jews. It is the unwillingness of Lebanon to rein in their terrorist, their local terrorist organization of Hezbollah that is putting us at the brink of war. It is the irrational, immoral evil of the leaders of Turkey and Iran who support barbarism 
over civilization, who have dedicated themselves to the destruction of the state of Israel, they are the ones that are leading the Middle East to the brink of a wider war. Shame on the Wall Street Journal. They have a great editorial page and a disgusting front page. And this is one of the better newspapers in America today. Here's another title from the same front page of the Wall Street Journal. Strike kills Hamas's leading advocate of a Gaza ceasefire. <laughs> Strike kills Hamas's leading advocate of a Gaza ceasefire. Nothing about terrorism. Nothing about the blood on his hands. Nothing about the nature of the organization. No, no. He's a peace-loving Palestinian who's trying to get a peace, a ceasefire. And evil Israel, those nasty Jews, go along and they kill him. How evil is that? It's unbelievable how morally bankrupt the West has become, is and has become. They cannot stand by its one representative, by its one ally in the Middle East. Our intellectuals would place themselves on the cross to be sacrificed for the sake of Islamism, for the sake of the enemies of civilization, for the sake of the enemies of America. These are some of the best journalists in America. This is a newspaper owned by, you know, people on the right. This isn't about selling newspapers. That's just a, a stupid rationalization. This is about the underlying ideas of the journalists and the editorial board, the, the front page editors of the Wall Street Journal. This is about making a statement about what they think about what just happened. This is the culture in which we live. A culture of defeatism. A culture that has no conception of what the fight is really about. Has no conception of what's at stake. Has no conception of the difference between barbarism and civilization. By the way, I'm, I'm reading a really good book. I'll, I'll have to talk about it. I, I, I just finished it, The Fall of Rome. Um, and, and it's an anecdote to all those people who will tell you that, oh, no, no, nothing happened after the fall of Rome. Everything went back to normal. You know, the, the barbarians were not really barbaric, and the barbarians, you know, they, they continued Rome's traditions, and everything just continued normal. And this is, an, uh, he, he, this is a corrective to that. No. Barbarism exists. Barbarism is barbaric, and it drives us backwards. And dark ages were dark ages. They were dark. And if we let, if we let these Wall Street journalists run things, if they are the standard, then dark ages is where this culture is heading. Really, really despicable. I mean, this is, these are, these are civilizational issues. These are people who want to kill us all. And we have here uh, a representative of our own side who want to just capitulate, who want to just surrender, who want to give in, give up. We saw this after 9-11, and we're seeing it in spades. We're seeing it in spades now. All right, um, everybody is still waiting with bated breath um, for what will, uh, what will transpire here. Uh, Hezbollah is not going to stay quiet. It's not clear what Iran is going to do. Uh, the funeral for the Hezbollah commander is going to be held tomorrow in Beirut. The supreme leader of Hezbollah, he must be a little worried right now, is expected to give a virtual speech. There's a reason he's giving it virtually. 
He is hiding in an undisclosed bunker deep below uh, uh, Beirut. He's learned from the military leadership of Hamas to dig deep, dig deep. Um, so uh, uh, he is going to give a speech tomorrow. I expect any response from Hezbollah to be after that speech. So uh, I don't expect anything to happen overnight. Uh, the funeral will go, uh, the, the, the funeral will be uh, uh, while things are relatively peaceful. And, and then I expect Hezbollah. Of course, the fact that Israel is just sitting on its hands and waiting, waiting for Hezbollah to take the initiative, that in and of itself is, 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 yeah, is, is despicable, is, is, is a sign of weakness. Um, and uh, so, uh, you know, it's going to be it's going to be interesting to see, uh, you know, what happens. There's also some conf some reports that a senior uh, a senior general, probably not as senior as the initial reports suggested, of the uh, Islamic Revolutionary Guard, uh, was killed in Damascus uh, last night as well. So or this morning, so uh, a lot is going on. A lot is going on uh, in, uh, in uh, the Middle East right now, and uh, I expect uh, in, in the very short run a significant expansion of, uh, of hostilities of the war, uh, and, uh, and we'll have to see where all of that, uh, where all of that ultimately, ultimately takes us. Um, but there's no question that it's going to be very tough on Israel, uh, given uh, given the, the, the given the ability the abilities that Hezbollah has, and um, you know, given it uh, given the proximity again of Lebanon to Israel, as I showed you on the map the other day, all of that um, it it's it's going to be. It's going to be uh, it's going to be interesting. Uh, the United States, by the way, killed yesterday um, a number of members of the Iranian-backed parallel military group uh, Katib Hezbollah in Iran. So uh, in Iraq, so in Iraq, as uh, partially as a response to uh, uh, to attacks on Americans uh, in uh, in the um, uh, in, in Iraq and in Syria. Um, all right, let's see. Something else I wanted to say about all of this. Um, uh, I guess not. All right. So that is where we are, and uh, I will keep you posted uh, as things develop. Again, I don't expect anything dramatic until until sometime after Nasrallah's speech uh, tomorrow. So uh, you know, we'll see. When that happens, and and what uh, what what uh, Hezbollah decides to do about it all, and of course that'll depend also on Iran and and what Iran is it wants to do and what Iran is willing to do.